Today we're going to talk about pull backs. Pull backs are another form of quite simple limit, at least simple compared with the, the wild things that we'll get later. Um, and they're very useful, and in fact you've seen them before, I promise you you have, you just perhaps didn't know that that's what they were. So let's just see what a pullback is for a stop. Now, the, the data that you start with is a bit more complicated than we've had for our limits before. You start with a pair of maps. So you have one map here and one map here um, in a category. And a pullback is you have a vertex U and you have a pair of projection maps. So you can think of this a bit like being a product, and we'll see later that it's closely related to products. But where with products, we had just an A and a B, and we didn't have this bit, and we got from our limit a vertex together with a pair of projection maps. It's the same kind of thing now. We have a vertex, a pair of projection maps, which I'll call P and Q. Now this diagram has to commute. So this diagram commutes, and it's the best possible one among all such diagrams. So this is going to have a universal property, and as usual, the universal property says it's the best one. How do we express that? We say, given any other one, there's a unique factorization. So you should be starting to recognize this form of universality now. So what's another one? We've got to say, given another one. So another one is a square like this. Now, the f and the g parts are the bits that are sort of fixed whenever we're thinking about this particular kind of limit. So another one is another vertex V and another pair of projection maps, let's call them S and T, such that the outside square commutes. So given that, there has to be a unique factorization here, which I'll call H, making both this triangle and this triangle commute. Uh, so perhaps I should write a bit more. Well, I'll just indicate over here. So again, you've got to read this as a kind of dynamic diagram. So what this is saying, so pullback, um, pullback, we often call this a pullback of G o along F because you can imagine that G is a thing over here and you're pulling it back along F until it gets all the way to here. Of course, there's some symmetry in this, de this definition. So you can also think of this as F being pulled back along G. So this is sometimes called the pullback of G along F. It's also a pullback of F along G by symmetry. We sometimes also write it like this, A cross B over C, and I'll explain a bit more where that notation comes from in a second. Um, anyway, this pullback is given by a commuting square uh, so I suppose I should draw it, but I can't really be bothered. But it's the commuting square that's got U up there and A, B, and C here. And then we have the universal property such that for all other squares, so that's the outside now, let me just draw this quickly like this. So for all commuting squares like that, commuting, there exists a unique H like that, making the diagram commute. So, what else is there to say about this? Well, probably first we should immediately see an example of what you, what kind of thing you get when you do this. So when you do this to sets, something quite simple and quite nice comes out of it. Uh, uh, what should I take off? I'll take this off. So in set, in the category of sets and functions, what we're going to get, so we've got a function here, and we've got a function here as well. And what we've got to produce is some set together with projection maps that make these commute in the best possible way. So if you think about it, maybe you shouldn't think about it, let's try thinking about it. If you think about it, um, if these maps weren't there, you would just take the product and this would be the set of ordered pairs. If you take the Cartesian product, you get the set of ordered pairs A, B. 
right? A in here and B in there. But we've got this extra condition now, which is that when we map down to there and we map down to here, we've got to land in the same place. So all we're going to do is restrict to those pairs A and B that actually land in the same place when you hit them with F and G. So what we're going to get over here is the set of pairs A comma B in A cross B such that F of A equals G of B. Um, um, um. Now, for the universal property, what we've got to do is we've got to take another set, V, equipped with... Uh, I'm crashing, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, uh, equipped with functions S and T, making the outside commute, we've got to make some morphism going down here. Now, to construct this morphism, it's very similar to what we did with products, she said, desperately hoping that it is very similar to what we did with products. Um, so you've got to say, okay, let's have a little look at a little, a little V uh, in this set here. Now, it lands somewhere over here, and it lands somewhere over here. But what we've got to do is we've got to send it to some pair here in such a way that it will make a square commute. Now, what pair of objects in A and B could we possibly send it to? Just, just stare at this for a second. How could you possibly dream up a, an object in A and an object in B starting from this little V over here? Well, there's one thing you can do. You can hit it with S, which produces you an object in A, and you can hit it with T, which produces you an object in B. So that's the most obvious thing you could do. And because it's the most obvious, you hope that it's going to be the right one. So now I've completely messed up this diagram. What should I do? Help, help, help. OK, this, this morphism I'm constructing here is going to be called H. So H is going to go from, right, it's going to take um, V, and it's going to send it to the pair S of V, T of V. Now, this is still a thought experiment, right? Because we don't know yet that that's actually landed in the right place. We know that if we're going to make these triangles commute, then this jolly well has to be what H does, because otherwise it's all going to go wrong. So if it exists, then it has to be that. That's the uniqueness. Now we can see whether this actually does land inside this, um, this set here. So how do we tell if it's landed in the set? We see if this condition holds. So we need to check that F of the first thing, F of S of V, equals G of the second thing. That's the condition that shows that it's really in this, this pullback. And now, is this true? Why is this true? Well, oh look, F composed with S is this side, and T composed with G is this side. And this commutes by the assumption we put in the first place, because we said, given any V together with functions S and T making the outside commute. So this commutes, this is true, since the outside of the diagram commutes. And so we've now constructed something that really is a unique factorization, showing that that really was the correct thing to take as the pullback of those two things. Now, this is sometimes also called a fibered product. Um, and you can see why, because it's sort of like a product, except that it's fibred, because you're taking the fibers uh, sort of over each of the individual elements of C. You're taking the things that actually land in the same place there. Uh, this is sometimes also called a Cartesian square, um, especially in French. And, uh, <laughs> um, and for this reason, when you see things that are Cartesian, Cartesian functors, Cartesian monads, Cartesian natural transformations, Cartesian categories, that's often something to do with behaving well with, with respect to pullbacks. And next time we'll look at the dual and possibly another example.